Good evening. I'm Anthony Austin, Director of Wilmette Public Library. Welcome to this year's Meet the Author event featuring our guest, Omar El Akkad, author of What Strange Paradise. This event is generously sponsored by the Friends of the Wilmette Public Library. Tonight's virtual format enables us to welcome viewers everywhere to our community, and we're happy that you have joined us from near and far. Thank you for being here. Before I introduce our guests, a bit about our program. Tonight's event is a Zoom webinar, which means that you, the audience, can see us, but we cannot see you. By default, your cameras are off and you are muted. Following this evening's conversation between Jack Dappelt and Omar el we will take your questions, which will be moderated by our programming partners, Barbara Goodman and Amy Barrow. Hi there. Hi. You are encouraged to submit your questions at any time during the program by using Zoom's Q&A feature. We will do our best to address as many as we can. If you have not yet read What Strange Paradise, please contact Wilmette Public Library or your own local public library to borrow a copy. If you wish to purchase a personal copy of the book, we invite you to do so from the bookstall, our local independent booksellers who are partnering with us for this event. There are a number of specially signed book plates available through the bookstore. Watch for a follow-up email from the library that will include ordering information and a link to the bookstall's website. Now to our main event. Tonight, our author will be in conversation with Jack Doppelt, the Hamad bin Khalifa Altani Professor Emeritus at the Metal School of Journalism at Northwestern University. He is, the, he is the publisher of Immigrant Connect, an online storytelling network for immigrants and their families and communities in and around Chicago, and The Doppelt Effect, a blog of writings, commentaries, and musings. Omar el Akkad is an author and journalist. He was born in Egypt, grew up in Qatar, moved to Canada as a teenager, and now lives in the United States. The start of his journalism career coincided with the start of the War on Terror, and over the following decade, he reported from Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay, and many other locations around the world. His work has earned the National Newspaper Award for Investigative Journalism and the Goff Penny Award for Young Journalists. His fiction and nonfiction writing appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, Guernica, GQ, and many other newspapers and magazines. His 2017 debut novel, American War, is an international bestseller and has been translated into 13 languages. It won the Pacific Northwest Best Booksellers Award, the Oregon Book Award for Fiction, the Kobo Emerging Writer Prize, and has been nominated for more than 10 other awards. It was listed as one of the best books of the year by the New York Times, Washington Post, GQ, NPR, Esquire, and was selected by the BBC as one of 100 novels that changed our world. This year, for his second novel, tonight's selection, What Strange Paradise, Mr. Akkad recently won the 2021 Scotiabank Giller Prize, awarded to the author of the best Canadian novel, graphic novel, or short story collection published in English. Congratulations. <laughs> With that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, author Omar El Akkad, in conversation with Jack Doppelt. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Anthony, and thanks to the Wilmette Library for giving me an opportunity to talk to Omar. I love the book and the opportunity that somebody can have to actually have a chit chat with the author is, is really special. Omar is talking to us not from any of the places that Anthony mentioned, but from Colgate outside Syracuse, uh, where pipes are bursting around him, but he'll, he'll get through it. All right, Omar, so um, just a few things to uh, kind of kick us off. The things that made your book so memorable to me is the inventiveness, the shimmering inventiveness of your writing. And because of that, we're gonna sprinkle Omar's prose into the exchange that Omar and I have. So you can all savor the writing, whether you've read the book or you're about to buy the book. Omar has said that many of the characters' monologues are really conversations that we all should be having. So this evening, we'll take on those conversations. The second thing that makes his book so memorable to me are his acute observations of the, our intertwined lives together on the planet that he voices through his characters in the book. And the third 
is the challenge he presents to all of we readers to crack what he calls our collective privilege of instantaneous forgetting. So Omar, let's open with the third question. It's apparent that you're disturbed by our tendency to forget and move on even in the face of the most urgent matters. Um, talk to us about that. Thank you so much for doing this, first of all. I really appreciate it. I know, I know a ton of work goes into this. Um, I'm grateful to you and everybody at the Wilmot Public Library for, for having me. Um, <clears throat> just to expand slightly on the very cryptic bursting pipes comment, uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a hotel room uh, where for the last hour and a half we've had continuous fire alarms because there's a steam pipe that is not behaving as it should. So if at some point uh, I become drowned out by, by uh, blaring, um, that's, that's what's going on. I should say, I am not personally responsible for this. Uh, I did not go and do anything to said pipe. Uh, it's just one of, the, um, one of the things that happens in the Zoom age. Um, so yeah, what, what Strange Paradise is, a, is a, it's a repurposed uh, fairy tale of sorts. Um, I took the story of Peter Pan. I wanted to take a comforting fable that Westerners have been telling their kids for the last hundred years, and I wanted to invert it. I wanted to use it to tell a different kind of story. And a big part of my reasoning had to do with this idea of, I think, the collective sort of psychic self-defense mechanism that a lot of us um, retreated into, particularly during the Trump years, where you know I, I genuinely couldn't tell you you know, what the scandal of the day was three years ago. I, yeah. You know, there was, there was something new every day and, and almost as a, as a, as a self-defense mechanism, you just, you learn to forget and become outraged about the next thing because you don't have enough reservoir of outrage to, to, to be sufficiently outraged about everything. Yep. And I wanted to do the opposite of moving on. I wanted to dwell. And so I took one fictional character, this nine-year-old boy, and I set the camera on him and I, I didn't make it move away. Um, I don't know if that, you know, inevitably when you try to do something like this, I don't know that the ends ever end up justifying the means. I don't know if this has changed anyone's mind. I don't know if it's changed anyone's perspective on who gets the privilege of being designated sufficiently human. Yeah. Um, but I do know that when I, when I go into it, the driving force is always some kind of anger. And at this, with this book, it was anger over just how easy it is to be momentarily outraged and then the next day move on to be outraged by something else. So you are both an author and a journalist. So how do, what's the difference for you as author or you as journalist in this responsibility that you've taken on to get us to not forget so fast? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those things I'm going to have to, um, there's the, in, in the little bio, there's that thing about the Goff Penny Award for young journalists, and inevitably I'm going to have to take that out of the bio because I'm not young anymore, that thing, the cutoff age for that thing was 25, and I'm not, I'm not 25 anymore. Um, You're not a town elder either, though. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in that middle space where none of these awards are, are, are particularly impressive, um, I spent 10 years as a journalist uh, at the Globe and Mail, which is the national paper up in, in Canada. And um, that was the education I didn't get in college. Uh, in college, I spent all my time at the student paper. I never went to class. They gave me a computer science degree, I think just to get me out of there. Uh, there's no good reason for me to have that degree. I, um, I spent all my time at the student paper. But those 10 years at the Globe were, were an education in writing. They were on a line level when you have back desk editors, extremely unsentimental back desk editors sort of slashing your copy left, right, and center. That's a kind of education. You also get an education in sort of witnessing the first draft of history uh, and being a part of that. Um, but fiction has always been my first home. It's, it's where, you know, what I started writing as a kid, and it's always been um, the place I go whenever I think of what home constitutes for me, because I'm one of those people who can't point to a particular part of the world and say, this is home. Uh, I've been a migrant since I was five years old. Um, so I was writing, at the time that I was working as a journalist, I was writing fiction uh, in my spare time. I wrote three novels before my first one, before American War, and they were very, very bad. 
uh, thoroughly unpublishable novels, but they were, um, I think of them as sort of sit-ups, you know, I don't necessarily want to see my favorite athlete do sit-ups, but I understand the, the reason to do it, you know, to be able to do the, the thing you actually want to do. Um, I think of, you know, by necessity, journalism is about answers, who, what, where, when, how, if you don't have these things, you don't have a piece of journalism. Um, but I was increasingly being left with residual experiences that took the form of questions, questions that I didn't have an answer for. And that immediately is when I go to fiction. Um, so one of the things about my novels is that they're not particularly prescriptive. There's no like, you know, if you do this, then everything will work out. Um, and so that's why I, I, I sort of tackled this particular issue in the form of fiction, because I knew at the end of whatever it was I was doing, I wasn't going to have any answers. Um, and that's, that's the reason to, to do it in the sort of, in the novel form instead of through hard journalism. We'll talk a little bit later about how you inverted the Peter Pan idea, but you had other inspirations too. So let's put some of them on the table because they're fascinating. One of your inspirations was when you returned to Egypt after living there. Talk about that for a bit. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Egyptian by birth. My family's all Egyptian dating back God knows how many generations. But I left when I was five. My father had to get out of the country uh, in the mid 80s. Well, I mean, for the entirety of my lifetime, the political and economic situation in Egypt has not been particularly good. Um, and um, my dad actually found a job in Libya, of all places. Huh. And so we're at the airport. We're getting ready to go to Libya. And uh, the way Arab names work is that, you know, my middle name is my father's first name. His middle name is his father's first name. So my name is Omar Mohammed al -Akkad. My father's name is Mohammed Ahmed. And Mohammed Ahmed happens to be an incredibly common combination of names. A lot of people are named Mohammed Ahmed, including a guy who was on the terrorism watch list. So we end up being taken into secondary. Um, we miss the flight, the job offer is revoked. And then a little while later, he gets another job offer in Qatar, which you're familiar with, um, you know, was on, was on its way to becoming the richest place on earth, basically pound for pound. And so the entire trajectory of my life is in large part, you know, the reason I sound like this, the reason I can read and write English the way I do, all of that can be traced back to a coin flip at an airport, you know, a case of mistaken identity. Huh. Um, and I was thinking about that a lot when I was writing this book, I was, I was thinking about the notion that so much of how we end up is either predetermined before we're born or determined through accidents of fate or something like that. Um, that. That weaves its way into the novel quite a bit. But I was back in Egypt. I was, uh, I was back as a journalist in 2012 and I was covering the aftermath of the Arab Spring. And I was driving around town with an old high school buddy of mine who I met in Qatar and then he moved back to Egypt. And he was complaining about the rent. You know, the rent's too high, the rent's too high. And at one point I asked him, what, okay, so what's the price for an apartment in your building, for example? And he said, well, do you mean the locals price or do you mean the Syrians price? I said, what the hell's the Syrians price? What are you talking about? I said, well, we've had this influx of people who've, who've come down here and they have no choice. They can't go anywhere else. So you can charge them three times as much. I mean, what are they gonna do, like leave? And just the casualness with which this was happening. Um, there, there was a demographic that could be exploited. And so it was going to be exploited. And that's not a quintessentially Egyptian thing. That's, I think, is fairly universal in the societies we've created. That was the starting point for thinking about the things that eventually led to, to this novel, was just how easily and readily you could do this to people with no, no consequences whatsoever. You capture that really nicely through Amir's mom, who watches soap operas. Why does she watch soap operas? You know, we all know kind of about immigrants or outsiders learning English and about the United States through TV. So you write, she needed to sound like the place in which she hopes to start her life. She wanted to avoid the immigrant's markup. Yeah, I, um, I have a lot of cousins who look like me and who have similar names as me. And, and the only reason they often get taken into secondary and I don't when they come over here is because of the way I sound. You know, if I called most people up on the phone and said my name was John Smith, they'd probably believe me. Um, and that is in large part because I am descendant from generations who, as a result of Egypt's history and the history of colonialism in general, believed English, French to be the winner's language. And so from a young age, 
they were going to make sure their kids knew these languages so that they could succeed in the kind of world that they'd been brought up to believe, you know, the hierarchy that they'd been uh, made aware of from a very young age. And um, it's, it's one of those things that is particularly insidious because A, my every experience of my life has shown that it works and has shown that it really, really helps me to sound like this. Um, and it really, really doesn't help my relatives and the people I know who don't sound like this, who have the Egyptian accent, who have some foreign accent. But B, it's also one of those things about you that you can change. You know, I can't really change my skin color. I can't change my ethnicity. I can't really change my religion. I've been Muslim the entirety of my life. I could change it superficially, but it wouldn't change my upbringing and, and who I've become. But man, you can work on something like your accent. And so I was, I was fascinated by that as an identity marker, an external identity marker in terms of how people judge you, so because it was something that you could work on and you could try to change. Um, and certainly in my life, it's made a huge, huge difference. In your epitaph or your double epitaph into the book, you mentioned Peter Pan. You don't mention though, how you came to the title of the book, What Strange Paradise. So you wanna tell us a little bit about Emma Lazarus's poem that got you inspired to use it and what she meant by it and what you adapted. Sure, yeah, so Epox is not one of my favorite Emma Lazarus poems. It's, it's okay. you know, the line at the end towards the end of that poem is suck with me, which, which is where the title comes from, What Strange Paradise. But Emma Lazarus's poetry in general and, and what she did during her life really stuck with me. She was, um, of course, she's most famous as the, um, the creator of the New Colossus, which is the poem on etched into the Statue of Liberty, you know, bring your poor, your tired, your, your huddled masses. Um, but she was very much concerned with the plight of Eastern European Jews uh, escaping persecution. This was about 100, 100 some years ago. Um, and she wrote a lot about that. And one of her poems that really sticks with me was about these two European Jews who escape persecution and find themselves in rural Texas of all places. And they're sitting around and they're thinking, oh, thank God we're safe. Uh, finally, what the hell is this place? We don't know anything about it. We have no, you know, they, they're basically completely disoriented by, by this new place they find themselves in. Um, and so I, I, I knew I wanted a line from one of her poems and uh, what strange paradise fit the bill in terms of um, structurally what the book is trying to do, what the after chapters are. You know, the book is split into before and after chapters. It starts with a shipwreck on a Western island and then splits into everything that happened before that shipwreck and everything that happened after that shipwreck. And the after chapters in particular, um, they're very much, um, they have a string of fantasy running through them and a string of, of um, near surrealism, I think. And the title seemed to, um, to fit with that. Um, but yeah, Emma Lazarus' is, is poetry, I think, really hit, hit, hit a nerve with me because so much of it felt like it was from three years ago. Um, you know, the same is true with the book that most influenced me when I was writing What Strange Paradise, which is a book called The Wandering Jews, which again is from about 100 years ago and um, details the journey of, of Eastern European Jews making it to the west of the continent only to find a different brand of persecution there. Mm -hmm. And how similar the minor details were about the necessity of forging ID cards yeah. because you've been put into a position to do that. All of that stuff felt so much like it could have been written in 2015. Yep. Uh, those echoes really, really resonated with me when I was, when I was writing the book. Right, so let's, let's you, you already mentioned the kind of the basic structure of the book, the before and after with the middle being the actual boat transport itself and the shipwreck. Um, and then you've got the Peter Pan references or the Peter Pan inspiration. I think the quick take for me is that obviously you have a character, uh, Colonel Kethros, he's Hook, clearly. Um, and your main characters are actually the way I think you wrote the book, you have two main characters. You have Amir, he's Peter Pan in a way. Um, and then you've got Vana or Vena. Uh, Vana is the Swedish word for friend. And my sense is um, 
she's Tinkerbell. She was she was my original Wendy, um, and the name the name um, there's this probably apocryphal story about how J.M. Barry came to the name Wendy for, for in Peter Pan, yeah, which has to do with one of his childhood friends um, trying to call him Friendy but not being able to pronounce the R, so saying Wendy, and so Vanna Van is the you know Swedish for friend. Um, I was I was thinking a little bit when I was putting the book together about, I mean, if you're trying to do something like this, it's almost an impossible tightrope, right? Because if the reference is too overt, then it's too overt. Sure. And if it isn't, then it's not there at all. And you're sort of trying to, to navigate through that. But I was, I was, um, I was thinking about the origins of that story. So J.M. Barry, who wrote it, and who was the most famous playwright in the world at his peak, also about a hundred years ago. Um, when we talk about Peter Pan today, we tend to talk about sort of Peter Pan syndrome, you know, this idea of, of the man who refuses to stop acting like a child. Yep. And um, the origins are the exact opposite. The origins are Jan Barry's older brother who died as a child in an accident, a skating accident. And uh, it crushed the family. His mother never recovered. One of the ways that his mother would try to comfort herself is to say, well, at least he'll never grow old. And so the origins are not the man who refuses to stop acting like a child. It's a child who never gets a chance to become a man. And so I wanted that inversion. But a lot of what lives there in terms of, of Peter Pan references are, you know, there's some of the obvious ones like, like the hook character. So my Colonel Kethros, instead of missing a hand, he's missing a foot that he lost in a, you know, when he stepped on a landmine. But then there's the, most of it is just, it's real inside baseball stuff. Um, there's a scene there's a scene where they, Vanna and Amir are trying to disguise him. They're trying to get him new clothes and they settle on a Cleveland baseball jersey that they steal from the hotel room of these American tourists. Well, in the original Peter Pan, they disguise him as quote unquote an Indian, right? And so like, you know, it's stuff that's like that. Here. Yeah, that's good. So it's not, unless you're really sort of familiar with Peter Pan, it's not the sort of thing that, that, that kind of jumps off the page. And that was, that was somewhat deliberate, I think. Sure. One of the things you capture about Peter Pan, though, again, a little bit obscure, but it's perfect for me. You have a, a character, Madame Ward, who lives on the island and is kind of, uh, how would you describe her? Tiger Lily. Um, <laughs> she's, um, she's, she is the conscience of that island to right, a certain right. extent. So Runs the, the makeshift refugee camp uh, on the island. Yeah, you have her saying, I think, she's seen, or you say, I think, she has seen so many kids, people over the last year, alone, malnourished, orphaned by war or by sea, made into the undercurrent of themselves, broken in ways that rendered them unable to continue as children, and yet a part of them childlike forever. So, yeah. It's um, uh, it's there's if you're ever if you're ever sort of driving around downtown Cairo for example and you get stuck in the traffic jam which you will because that's all of Cairo yeah. is, is just one big traffic jam you'll find there's someone coming to knock on the on the window of of your of your car and it's a kid it's, you know, about about a mere's age would be would be the age that you're looking at. About nine, and they'll be trying to sell you something. They'll be trying to sell you individual packets of uh, Kleenex or garlands of something, whatever. And and these are human beings whose whose lives have been predetermined uh, to a certain extent. Um, you know, the next Einstein might be knocking at your window, but they're not going to get a chance to be that because it's all been been predetermined for them. Um, a lot of the stories I write gravitate towards childhood because I think it's the time of our only real honest interaction with the world before all of the obligations of the grown up world and late capitalism and all these systems we live under force us into whatever lies we need to tell ourselves to get through the day. And because I'm always writing about systems, you know, systemic injustice rather than individual injustice. 
I tend to collide the fundamental dishonesty of these systems with the fundamental honesty of childhood. Then none of that is to say that I do any of this properly or that I write children characters well or any of that. I just gravitate towards that time of life because I think that there's a fundamental honesty to it that renders the dishonesty of these systems we've created particularly glaring. Um, and so Madame uh, Elward is, is someone who has to see that every day because even though she's concerned with the plight of these human beings, she has to work within the system of this European country's right. Right. refugee protections. So she sees both of these things colliding every day. So, you know, you just mentioned that children, when we capture children, they're the, we capture them because they're the honest people in the world. You've also said though, and this fascinated me, that Colonel Ketras, is the only real honest character in the book. And I can appreciate that. He's also spine chilling. You set him up as a man, I love this line, as a man who excels in uniform and insignia. So tell us more about him through reading his, if you're willing to. There's a passage in the book that is chilling. Uh, it's on page 231 and it's, about Kethros basically um, pointing a finger. Sure. Um, so this is. Um, you need to set it up. Any okay, go ahead. Yeah. No, that's um, that's that's actually it's a better setup than I can do. Honestly, um, this is a confrontation between Amir, the child, and Kethros, who is this colonel who um, is nearing the end of his career and has been put on babysitting duty, what he sees as babysitting duty, which is on this island, he's in charge of chasing down these migrant ships and the migrants who, who arrive uh, across the Mediterranean. And for one reason or another, he has taken a particular interest in Amir and this boy and capturing him to the point that it's become kind of an obsession. And so finally they meet. And, um, and so they're talking for the first time. And um, even though this is a foreign country and Amir is from Syria, the Colonel, when he starts speaking to him, speaks a flawless Arabic that is of not only his country, but his particular neighborhood, Amir's old neighborhood at home for reasons that Amir cannot, cannot decipher. I think that's all you need to know. So I'll just read you a, a, short, a short passage from that interaction. Amir says nothing. In this closeness, he can see the sweat beating on the Colonel's forehead the tiny pouches of fat beneath his eyes, the silvering hairs along his temples, and each tiny detail in its evidence of mortality, of hurrying age, scrapes away at the veneer of soldiering physique he observed from a distance. Don't worry, the colonel says, patting the boy on the cheek. I'm not your accuser. I don't care what you are. Kethros lifts himself back up, wincing as his knee unbends. At a nearby sink, he washes the dust off his hands. A distant rumbling sound come, comes in through the open windows, mingling with the sound of the sea. But you should know what you are, he says. You are the temporary object of their fraudulent outrage, their fraudulent grief. They will march on the streets on your behalf. They will write to politicians on your behalf. They will cry on your behalf. But you are to them in the end, nothing but a hook on which to hang the best possible image of themselves. Today, you are the only boy in the world, and tomorrow it will be as though you never existed. Amir eyes the cabin's front door, wide open, the cliffside and the forest visible just a few hundred feet away. Hate me all you want, but at least to me you exist, the Colonel says. To me, you've never stopped existing. Yeah, very, I mean, really chilling. It, he's talking to Amir, but he's talking to all of us. This is part of the dialogue or, that you want the characters to get us to have as we address all these issues. So one quick reference I've got on that is, you know, you say Kethros is your hook, which is of course fine and right. To me, he reminded me of, have you seen the Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards? He reminds me of the German colonel who is sitting in a house 
where I think the Jews are hidden in the basement. And you know, through the exchange he's got with whoever he's talking to, and I don't even remember who that was, and he knows exactly what's going on. And he knows that there are people in the basement. And he's so far ahead of what's happening, which makes him so chilling and vicious. That's kind of who Kethros was to me. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because the, the one, there's, there's a scene a little earlier in the book where, where that, that most reminds me of, of that, that character you're talking about, which is there's a point where Kethros is chasing Amir and one of his subordinates, this young man who's a soldier under his command, uh, decides to help the children. He decides to help Amir escape and then very quickly owns up to it afterwards under grilling from Kethros because he can't, he can't withstand that. And at one point, Kethros, you know, pats him on the shoulder and says something like, um, imagine how little would get done if all men had spines. Um, he's, he's very much dependent on the idea that, that people will, will fold, um, that people won't do the right thing when it comes down to it. Um, he has a very sort of surface level understanding of masculinity, I think. Um, you know, when I was in high school, we used to have this physics teacher who was obsessed with the idea that you should never memorize formulas. You should always be able to derive them from first principles. You know, I give you speed and distance and you, you figure out the trajectory of the ball in the air. And I think, I think Kethros has memorized the formulas of traditional masculinity, what it means to be a strong man, but has no idea how to derive them from, from principles, first principles of kindness or decency or anything like that. And so he has this very shallow surface layer understanding of what it means to be a man. And anytime that understanding is pierced, the only thing holding it up is violence. Yeah. That's, that's all he's got as a load bearing being. Wow. Yeah. You also do a really, really uh, penetrating job of taking on the West, meaning us, you know, the observers of all this. And you kind of pierce the dream of the West for you know for refugees for people who dream that america is gold and their chance for freedom you have a character mohammed who's basically a coyote in charge of the ref refugee transport who sets the passenger straight about the west you have him saying you think the black market is bad brother wait till you see the white market there are three things you need to know about america first everyone there is racist especially the ones who tell you they're not. Second, they're terrified of sex. And third, no matter the crime, they will always find themselves innocent of it. There is a passage that you have with Muhammad then turning to his fellow passengers to take them to task. So he takes on the West and then he takes on kind of humanity through his fellow passengers. You willing to read that passage too? Yeah, absolutely. And 179, and it's wicked and wonderful. So this takes place nearing the end of the boat journey. The boat journey starts in Alexandria. It's a group of refugees trying to make it to Europe. And they have they're put on this rickety boat by a bunch of smugglers, and the smugglers put one of their sort of juniors, you know the smuggler's apprentice is on the boat with them, this guy named Muhammad. And Muhammad, once the boat gets started, uh, reveals his deeply cynical nature about all of this, about this entire situation. And this particular sort of monologue takes place after a confrontation with one of the, one of the passengers where Muhammad finally loses his cool. Um, and I think, I think that's all you need to know here. Muhammad shoved the men aside. A trickle of blood ran down his forearm from where the lantern glass had cut him. He stood, teeth bared, one hand on the pistol at his side, the other pointing at Umm Ibrahim, pointing at everyone. You sad, stupid people, he said. Look what you've done to yourselves. The West you talk about doesn't exist. It's a fairy tale, a fantasy you sell yourself because the alternative is to admit that you're the least important character in your own story. You invent an entire world because your conscience demands it. You invent good people and bad people, and you draw a neat line between them because your simplistic morality demands it. But the two kinds of people in this world aren't good and bad. They're engines and fuel. Go ahead, change your country, change your name, change your accent, 
pull the skin right off your bones, but in their eyes, they will always be engines and you will always, always be fuel. Muhammad stopped. He looked around him, saw the way in which all those who had earlier tried to hold him back had now backed away from him. Watching them, he felt some disgust at himself for having lost his composure, for having laid hands on a woman and having yelled this way at the passengers who were, at the end of the day, customers. People no different than those he would rely on to make a living should he survive this apprenticeship and save enough money to run his own migrant fleet one day. But the men and the women who shrank from him now, as though from a rabid frothing animal, had barely heard a single thing he'd said. They stared only at his hand on the holster, at the gun by his side. Anyway, there's nothing to be done, Muhammad said quietly, as he slumped back in his place at the stern. People live, people die. Believe in whatever you want, but for now, sit down. The boat is old and won't take much more. The passengers quieted, the boat sailed, its diesel engine sputtering. Well, it picked the flashlight off the floor and hung it up again. With the lantern shattered, its light was now a solitary beam. Only a while later did Maher, looking up from his book of apocryphal scripture, break the silence. One should try to believe in things, he said, even if they let you down afterwards. What? Muhammad replied. Yeah, it's just something my favorite author once said. Muhammad closed his eyes. Your favorite author is wrong, he said. Yeah, tough. Say more, if you will, about the dichotomy that you set up between engines and fuel and about conflicts themselves being a distraction. And as you, as you are about to do that, let me um, reference something else that I thought of immediately when you were doing that. There is Catherine Ann Porter's book, Ship of Fools, which I was thinking about as the kind of energy side of Calypso is the name of the refugee boat. If the people on Calypso are the fuel, the world's fuel, Catherine Ann Porter's Ship of Fools, where the passengers are wealthy and oblivious to what's going on in Germany as the Nazis begin to take over. They're the energy, and yet they're as duplicitous and, um, you know, are more duplicitous than the people they take advantage of. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I grew up in, in Qatar, and my father was an accountant at what at the time was the only luxury hotel in Qatar, this thing called the Sheraton, you know, the Doha Sheraton, which in the mid 90s was the only hotel basically in the country and now is like this tiny dinky thing because they built all these four seasons and stuff right next to it. Um, but a lot of my childhood was spent in that place just running around the hallways and you know by the beach there and stuff. And you saw the collision of those two things. You thought you saw the collision of engines and fuels constantly to the point where that to me was the normal ordering of the world. There was nothing remotely abnormal about this. To give you a sense of, of what I'm talking about, the big shopping malls in places like Doha, and, which is the capital of Qatar, and Dubai and the UAE, and these places that are became very wealthy very quickly as a result of oil and natural, uh, natural gas. If you go to shopping malls, for example, every once in a while you, you'll find someone at the door at particular, particular places nightclubs, uh, stores, high-end stores, that sort of thing. You'll find someone at the door whose job it is to keep certain ethnicities out. And so one of my earliest memories of this was outside one of these shopping malls, they'd hired a guy from Southeast Asia, a migrant laborer, and basically told him, if you see anyone who looks like you, yeah. don't let them in, which is, uh, is it's nightmarish on so many levels, right? But it was, for, for the people who did this, it, was, it made perfect sense. Like who, who's better to tell what kind of people we don't, we don't, want, we don't want here than, than someone from that group of human beings. Uh, so you're, you'd be at the, the Sheraton, for example, and you would see the wealthy foreign businessmen and you would see them interacting with the wait staff who are all from a particular part of, of the, the, the world. Um, and you came to an understanding that this is how the world worked. And, and so I think of it in terms of, of, I don't know that I agree with everything Muhammad says, um, but I find it hard to fully disagree with the idea 
that you um, that you can't that this this society that we've created can't function without certain people being designated as fuel and certain people being designated as engines, and it being impossible to break that dichotomy apart. And so I think that's what he's trying to sort of get across. Before we move this over to Q&A so everybody else can chat with you as I have, which has been great. I want you to step, last question or so, I want you to step out of your characters and use them as your voice and have your own voice. What in the West calls you the most right now? I mean, I have the privilege by virtue of what I do for a living that I can sort of guess at the future from relative safety, the safety of fiction. Um, and as far as my guesswork goes, I think that in the next few decades, we are on the cusp of one of the largest migrations of human beings in our history. It's going to be as a result of climate change and as a result of the conflicts that come as a result of climate change. Right. And I think this notion that is endemic in the West, even among progressives in the West, that our fundamental approach to the refugee crisis should be one of charity, um, I think is fundamentally wrongheaded. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't like the idea of asymmetry as, as, a, as a starting point. This is a fundamental issue of justice. Um, the West is not a passive observer of the conflicts and the climate change disasters that are going to cause these human beings to have to leave their homes. And so any notion of thinking about the forced migration of human beings and the solution to that as being rooted in charity, yeah, I yeah. think fundamentally has to go um, because, uh, because that has real hard limits. And traditionally we know that when we hit those limits, we always resort to violence. We resort to razor wire and borders and men with guns at those borders and bloodshed. And, and all I am trying to do is anything in my power to avoid that outcome? Because I think that is the natural retreat point of anything that sees these people as over here and us as over here and, and uh, a sort of any helping hand as the fundamental mechanism of dealing with this. I, I, that terrifies me uh, more than anything. That is really well put. It kind of sets up what Lukashenko uh, is doing with migrants, Afghani migrants, and, and kind of pushing them to the Polish border and then letting them go, he's got Colonel Kethros written all over him, really. And it's, and it's strategy. These people are pawns. You yeah, use yeah. them for whatever great game you're playing. So I want to thank uh, all the people who've made it possible for you and me to chat, Omar, and especially Barb Gordon, Amy Barrow, and the good folks at the Wilmette Public Library. And now um, you and I will chat at some other point, and I want to turn it over to them for the Q&A. Thanks for spending time with me, Omar. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Omar and Jack, for such a thoughtful, enlightening conversation. And so we're going to go on to some audience questions, and we'll get to as many as time permits. So please, if you have a question, keep you can put it in the uh, put it in, and we will get to them. So here's a question. Did your experience as a journalist help you in writing a book about the refugee crisis in particular? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's been invaluable to all my fiction writing, uh, even before I get to the writing. Uh, all my research, um, both my novels were about a year and a half of research, a year to write the first draft, and then a year of rewriting, a year and a half of rewriting, roughly speaking. And so that, that first research period is very much informed by the investigative reporting I used to do. And so I have all of these big, you know, post-it note board things with lines and all of that stuff that you, it, sound, it seems like a movie prop, you know, and like a murder mystery or something, but it's, it's how I function as, as a researcher. So it helps me on a very sort of pragmatic level, um, but also in the sense that almost everything I write is informed by the residual experiences from my time as a journalist. There's things that I witnessed that I don't know how to rid myself of in the form of nonfiction, because they fundamentally take the form of questions I can't answer. And so that's when I move into fiction. Um, so it's informed the subject matter of the things I write about, the way I research, the way I put together the projects, uh, and I think it will for the rest of my life. 
Great, thank you. Can you talk about your timeline in writing this book when you started it? I know you talked about, about how long it takes you, but in terms of, um, did it correspond to any particular political or current events that might have informed it? Um, the instigating moment was in 2012 when I was back in, in, in Cairo. I was still working as a journalist and I saw just how readily that cruelty was apparent in all levers of society. Um, towards these human beings who are coming over from Syria. Egypt and Syria for a while, if I had been born a few years earlier, I would also be Syrian. Egypt and Syria for a while were the same country. There was this thing called the United Arab uh, Republic, I believe. And all of this nonsense that you hear from Arab leaders about our Syrian brothers and sisters and, and all of this stuff, it's all on, on the ground level, it's all nonsense. It's all rhetoric that means nothing. So that was the sort of moment where I started thinking about the things that would eventually congeal into uh, what strange paradise. But um, the writing process sort of went from, I want to say a couple of years after that, um, into the beginning of COVID, actually. We were, we were sort of, we were still making changes to the text, and I was still writing new portions into the beginning of the pandemic. And over the course of that time, you had these searing images that showed up. Um, the image of Alan Curdy, the boy who's, who's lying on the beach, who, of course, I think everyone is sort of familiar with that image of the man of his daughter and his daughter who was trying to cross into the US, they were trying to cross the river and they drowned. And it was these, you had these moments, but also the knowledge that in a few days time, everyone would move on to something else um, was one of the, the it, had, it had a huge impact on, on this particular, on the writing of this book. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I finished it. I finished it during the pandemic. And at that point I'd been locked up inside and I'd lost the capacity to figure out if the changes I was making to the book was making it better or worse. I sort of lost my, my orientation as a writer. Um, so it was, a very, it was very different versions of myself writing the book um, because the world was changing around me. But it sort of started as an idea in 2012 and finished um, in, well into the pandemic. Great, thank you. Great. Um, well, here's a question. I read that you showed the early manuscript of the book to four different people who each had different interpretations of the book and of the ending. And can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, because I'm a deeply insecure person, uh, <laughs> I tend to Google the title of the book every now and then just to see what people have been saying about it. And you know how Google does those suggestions? Like when you start typing, it'll say like, do you mean whatever? If you start typing what strange paradise, it says, you know, did you mean what strange paradise ending explained? So <laughs> somebody out there is having a real hard time with, um, with this text. Um, I, thought, I thought that wouldn't be the case because that was the case with American War, my first novel, which I intended to be a particular kind of book, but because it came out four months into the Trump administration was overwhelmingly read as a different kind of book. As a sort of, literal attempt at prophecy, you know, this is how a second civil war would go down, this is where America's headed, so on and so forth, when I was trying to do something else entirely. And I didn't think that would be the case with What Strange Paradise, because What Strange Paradise is a much shorter book, it's a much quieter book, it's much more focused in its intent. And yeah, the first four people had four entirely different interpretations of what was going on. And that's when I knew that I was in for a bit of a ride. Um, because even, even the people, who, so the writers who blurb the book, you know, those little quotes on the back, you know, this is the best thing I've ever read. And this thing we do for each other as writers, because, you know, we, the blurb industrial complex aside, but, but like it, one of the blurbs I was reading and thinking, thank you so much. This is so generous. I'm not 100% sure what book you read. Like the writer's interpretation of the book was entirely different from what I intended, but that used to scare me quite a bit. And now I find it very comforting because by definition, these things are gonna outlive me. And if they're gonna outlive me, I like the idea that they should have as many different lives as possible. Um, what I intended without sort of, you know, going into huge spoiler territory is very much tied up to with um, the epigraphs in, in, at the beginning of the book, particularly a, a short story that is quoted in the epigraphs. And structurally, if you're familiar with that short story, you have a pretty good idea of what you're getting into. But I will say that some of the reader 
there's been a lot of reader like angry emails from readers who absolutely did not like how I put this book together and, and how it turned out. Um, but some of the interpretations have been far more profound than anything I intended. And I, I also like that quite a bit. Great, thank you. Um, one of our viewers has commented saying, thank you for challenging the West for creating the environmental problems we now have. Any idea about how to appeal to those who fear being displaced by immigration in ways that instead they can embrace immigration as a form of social justice? The short answer is I don't know what, what would work because the sort of people that I envision as being challenged in their worldview by a novel such as this are, are to be perfectly honest, quite unlikely to pick it up in the first place. Um, one of the reasons that even though I write very quote unquote political books, I get very little hate mail. I think part of it is because I'm a guy and guys tend to get far less. All the female authors I know will get, will get tons of hate mail for everything they write. I think another part of it is that the sort of person who will give me the, you know, go back where you came from. If you don't like it, go back where you came from type of response is not the sort of person who's going to pick up and read a 350 page book. Uh, I get way, I, I wrote, I wrote once uh, an op-ed for the Guardian about being a brown guy in America. And it was the most benign thing. Like it wasn't particularly out there or anything. And I got more hate mail for that than I've ever gotten for any of my novels. Um, I think it was just easier to digest. Um, a lot of this, I feel like comes down to exposure. Uh, it comes down to, <laughs> um, comes down to Sorry. what happens when um, you create a, 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 a way of living that only puts you in contact with people who are exactly like you, which is, you know, an increasingly easy thing to do in the age of social media where you can just find your, your grouping and, and, and be done with it. I think anything that pierces that particular bubble is a good thing in the long run. Um, I don't know how to do that. I have no idea how to do that, particularly in a country like America, where you have the privilege of existing firmly within your particular ideological group and not having to exit it for any real reason. Um, but I think anything, including literature, and I think that's what literature does, anything that pierces that, that bubble is, is a good thing. I'm just very terrified of, of how hard that is to do these days. Thank you. Um, someone asks, they read that you wrote much of Strange, What Strange Paradise in Arabic and then translated it into English. And what was that process like? So, so I, I, that's a reference to the dialogue um, among the characters on the boat um, in the before chapters, the chapters describing the migrant journey to, to this, this particular island. And that dialogue was happening in my head in Arabic because most of the characters talking on the boat are, are talking in Arabic. And so it would happen in Arabic in my head. And much of it is stolen sort of verbatim from arguments I've had with my own family members in the past and you know that sort of thing. It's, it's sort of uh, halfway theft. Um, but then I would, I would translate it in my head into English and put it down. And one of the decisions I had to make very early on in the project was how jarring how, how much I was willing to live with the jarring aspect of that, because there's certain things about Arabic that once it's translated into English, make it sound very ornate, a sort of here be dragons kind of vibe to it, very sentimental, very, I was listening to an interviewer, uh, a translator, an interview with a translator who translates from Arabic to English. And she was talking about, for example, if you and I are sitting at the dinner table and I'm asking you to pass the salt, there's a common phrase in Arabic, uh, when nebi, when nebi, can you pass the salt? And she said, there's two ways to translate that. There's the way that that's the spirit of it, which is please, can you please pass the salt? And then you can do it literally, which is, I conjure the spirit of the prophet to command you to pass me the salt. <laughs> and it makes it sound like, you know, Arabian nights, right? Like you're in, you're, you're, and that's just, a, that's just a facet of the language. In, in Arabic, it doesn't sound that way at all. And so you have a situation where, for example, these people are calling each other brother all the time. You know, brother, you should do this, brother, you should do that. Well, in Arabic, we do that. It's like, like, it just pops up in the middle of sentences all the time. Uh, yehi this, yehi that. Um, but I decided that I wanted to do it that particular way and that I was going to 
I was going to take the opportunity cost. I was going to take the cost of it sounding a little bit jarring and a little bit off in English to, to translate it the way I wanted to. Um, and so that's the reference to, to the language being a bit of a translation process. So interesting. I think we have time for two more questions, Omar. Uh, this one is, can you tell us what authors inspire you and what you're reading now? Sure, yeah. I, because we're doing two questions instead of one, I'm not going to ramble for an hour and a half about my favorite authors, which is my natural tendency. I, weirdly enough, I, I, I come from a very, I have a very unanchored place in the world. I don't, I can't point to one place and say this is my home uh, because I moved around a lot. But the authors I love, a lot of them did exactly that. They marinated in one place. Um, I'm thinking of sort of Toni Morrison and the way she understood this country. Uh, Nagib Mahfouz in the way he understood Egypt. Um, uh, even, even something like um, the, the Magic Mountain, Thomas Mann's epic sort of, you know, what Susan Sontag called, I think, the, the thinkiest book ever written or something like that. Uh, and the way he understood this particular kind of European mindset. And, and uh, so, so those authors, even though man spent a lot of his life out in California because he had to get the hell out and so on and so forth. Same thing with somebody like James Baldwin who understood America but had to get, get to France because he, he knew full well that he could only be so angry as a black man in America before the system would end up killing him. I, I like those writers because they have, in addition to talent that I will never have, they also had this, this, this process of knowing the place uh, at a depth that I never will because I've moved around so much. Um, what I'm reading right now, what am I reading? Uh, I'm, in, I'm in blurbing hell and I won't, I won't talk about specific titles, but I it's just, I don't know, there's seasons for it where you get a bunch of blurb requests and some of them are amazing novels and some of them are less amazing novels. But um, I, I just finished reading um, Midnight in Cairo, which is an, an account of the roaring 20s nightclub scene in Egypt. Uh, and it's a fascinating book. It's just, it's full of these weird characters, German saboteurs, and the guy who ended up directing Casablanca shows up in Cairo in the 20s and is like, hey, you know what I want to do? I want to write a biopic about the Prophet Muhammad. And everybody's like, no, don't do that. That's a really bad idea. And so he says, okay, fine. And he goes off and directs Casablanca instead. Um, really amazing nonfiction account. Uh, and then the other one that, that really did it for me was... Um, a book by another Egyptian writer named Basma Abdelaziz. It's called Here is a Body, which is a novel based on the Rabah massacre. There was this massacre where the state went in and killed upwards of a thousand people in a day. And she wrote a, a novel based on that event. And uh, she knew full well what she was getting into. Uh, the state security services are now pulling the books off the shelves and it's unclear whether she'll be able to continue living in Egypt. Uh, very, very brave book, very good book. Uh, so those are two that, that pop into my head um, that I'm reading right now. Right, thank you. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful, but unfortunately our time is up. Uh, Omar, your alarms did not go off again, so <laughs> congratulations on that. But many, many thanks for gifting the world with your beautiful novel and for your time tonight. This has been such an inspiring evening and we're really honored to have had you with us. I also wanna thank Jack Doppelt again for leading such an engaging conversation. And of course, thanks to all of you who have been here with us tonight. Uh, please note that a recording to tonight's program will be available on the library's website within the next couple of days in case you want to watch it again or if you want to share the program with others, you will find it there on the website. Also, please keep an eye out for a follow up email from the library, which will include a short survey. And we'd really appreciate it if you would take a moment to complete the survey, provide us with some feedback on tonight's program. With that, and on behalf of everyone here tonight from the Wilmette Public Library, we wish you all a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks so much. Good night. Yeah.